Bien. Bonjour à tous. Hello everyone. Guten Tag. Buongiorno a tutti. Welcome to the press conference for Inglorious Bastards. C'est un film en plusieurs langues. It's a multi-language film, and I will introduce the people who are at this podium, sometimes according to the nationality. First and foremost, uh, the producer of this film, one of them, he's produced practically all of Quentin Tarantino's films, Mr. Lawrence Bender. In the audience, we also have other producers, most importantly, uh, Mr. Harvey Weinstein and Mr. Bob Weinstein. Uh, let's start with the French. Uh, as uh, Shoshana Dreyfus, actress Melanie Laurent. <laughs> then the Brits, as Lieutenant Archie Cox, Mr. Michael Fassbender. <laughs> Not in the movie. As General Fennec, Mr. Mike Myers. Now the Germans, ladies first, as leading actress and German star, Bridget von Hamsmark, Miss Diane Kruger. Uh, next to Mr. Lawrence Bender, as Frederick Zoller, the kid from Goodbye Lenin, Mr. Daniel Bruhl. <laughs> Little, little Danny Brule. <laughs> He's cute. And now the actor without whom the film would probably would not have come together the way it did, as Colonel Hans Lander, Mr. Christoph Waltz. <laughs> now the Americans as uh, <laughs> Donny Donowitz, uh, but he's also a director in his own right. Um, Cabin Fever, Hostel. He also directed the film within the film, Pride of the Nation, Mr. Eli Roth. <laughs> the main bastard, Mr. Brad Pitt. <laughs> and the uber bastard, director Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> and we'll have a first question here. Just a second, wait until we get the mic. And then the gentleman with the gray hair over there. Uh, good morning, uh, afternoon, whatever it is now. Bruce Kirkland from the uh, Toronto Sun. Um, <laughs> Hey, thank you, Mike. <laughs> a little hometown shout out there. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a question, um, it could be for anyone, but uh, perhaps I'll start it with uh, Mr. Tarantino and Mr. Uh, Pitt. Tarantino because he uh, made the movie and Pitt because he is the main bastard and, uh, and the avenging angel. And I'm wondering if this is a Jewish revenge fantasy made with a lot of comedy. Uh, yeah, that wouldn't be exactly how I would define it 100%, but I think you can definitely say that 100. Yeah, you can definitely say that, and it works completely as that way. That wouldn't be the section of the video store maybe I would put it in. All right. Uh, uh, but, you know, um, I mean, it's funny. People have come up to me a lot, and they've asked me, like, um, is it a fairy tale? Is it a, a Jewish wish fulfillment fantasy or just a wish fulfillment fantasy anyway? And, well, there are aspects of that, all right? But to me, more than anything else is, um, it's, you know, it, uh, the, the, exactly the way I look at it is this, is my characters changed the outcome of the war. Now, that didn't happen because my characters didn't exist, 
But if they had have existed, if there had have been a Friedrich Zoller who did what he did, Garibald's very well might have made a movie about him because he did make a movie in the vein of this or at that time of the war. And if that had happened, everything that happens later in the movie is plausible. All right. And so that's kind of where I'm coming from on it. Uh, well, you know, first of all, it's, it's definitely outrageous, which uh, um, I was game for. Um, but, uh, you know, more than that, I appreciate the international cast, the international, you know, the bringing uh, of, of the, all these people from, from, uh, from different countries that was true to the languages, their respective languages. He cast Germans for German, French for French, Americans for American, and so on and so forth. And Canadians for British. Yeah. <laughs> but you get my point. And uh, there was... It was just a, a great camaraderie, and uh, I really, I got to say, none of us, <laughs> none, of the, none of us have seen the film yet. Uh, uh, Quentin's kept it under wraps, under, the, under the, the golden curtain, so it's going to be really nice for us to all see it together tonight, because we'd all been, all we know is, you know, we, we, we wrapped like three months ago, and we shot our respective parts, and suddenly here we are. <laughs> so. I, I can say that being, you know, being Jewish, that... Uh, this is definitely a, a for me. Uh, it's it's like kosher porn. It's a it's something. <laughs> it's it's something I have fantasized about since I was a very young child, and it really was like I performed a sex scene when I, I beat that guy to death, and the blood spreading. Well, you get the idea. Question over there. Yeah, this, uh, Peter Paul Hu, German Television. Um, I have a two-part question to Mr. Tarantino. Uh, the first part is about, um, I read that you mentioned without Christoph Waltz you couldn't have been able to make the film. Could you tell us why that was and what impressed you about him? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the, the, the situation was this, is um, I realized I was writing a, a, a pretty impressive character fairly early on when I was still dealing with pen and paper when it came to Colonel Hans Landa. And one of the things about the character is the fact that he's a linguistic genius. It is just simply one of the, the main, one of the aspects about the character. And I knew that whatever actor I cast to play this has to be as much of a linguistic genius as Landa is, or else he would never, he would never come off the page. He would, he would be trapped on the page. An actor could do the best job they could have, they could try, they could try, but if they just didn't have that in, as part of their character, it just wouldn't work. He would never be what he was on the page. So, having said that, um, and I, I think I was quite white, rightfully proud of that character. So uh, I started casting actors uh, in, in, in Germany, and I wasn't finding anybody who quite had every everything that I needed, 100 percent. You know, they could, do the, they could do the poetry in this language, but they couldn't do the poetry in that language. They could do the poetry in this language, in this language, but not in that language. And he had to be able to say the poetry in every language. And I literally had a moment where I didn't think I was going to find it. And I called the producers and said, look, uh, if we can't find the right Londa, I'd rather just publish this script and do something else. And if I'm going to pull the plug, because I was financing the movie by that, I was, we were going to get our, 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 our cash flow money by, on like Friday. This was Monday. And I go, if I'm going to pull the plug, i got to pull it now during this week while it's still only my money involved. And so I go, uh... <laughs> If we don't find him, I'm pulling the plug on Thursday, and we're just going to publish the script, and that's going to be it. And the producers, Lawrence and everybody, they were, they were very cool about it. They didn't overreact. They go, well, then you know what? Here's the deal. Then we just spend, you know, this week is just Londa, 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 Londa. And I can just tell you the day that Christoph came, walked in the room, sat down, and read two scenes. I remember thinking, and Lawrence was sitting right next to me, I go, we're making a movie. Thank you. <laughs> Not only that, hands down. Stop for a second, yeah. please. The second part is... But ha hands down. <laughs> Literally... See, he's a sweet guy. <laughs> he ain't so bad. <laughs> he's misunderstood. <laughs> I looked over Quentin when he was... When he was uh, grab your mic. 
Oh, I just looked at Quentin as he was, as Christoph was reading, and I could see Quentin's eyes were just like, oh my God. Mm -hmm. And he, and Christoph, of course, walked out and thanked us, and he walked out, and Quentin, we jumped up and go, <laughs> high five, <laughs> we're making the movie. <laughs> but you know, I got to say one thing about that, just, uh, just to say, you know, don't get me wrong, I wasn't being cavalier when I said I wouldn't make it. You know, this movie meant everything to me, but there was something, um, there was also something very liberating about knowing you wanted it exactly the way it had to be and you would walk away from it rather than make a compromise of that sort. There was something very liberating about it, too. I mean, it wasn't cavalier, but there was something liberating that, look, this is either going to be right on or ain't going to be on at all. The second part. The second part is you said um, you love all your uh, characters. Could you love all the characters in this film as well? Oh uh, well, you know, yes, I yes I can because I love them like you know like I love them from this God perspective. <laughs> All right, because I am God as far as these characters are concerned. I created them, all right? And I love them from their perspective, all right? You know, they know where they're coming from. And, and uh, so, yes, the, the, the answer is yes. Every, I think one of the things that kind of comes out in the film, yes, there's bad guys, yes, there's this, but there is an aspect where everybody is everybody, and that comes out through the course of the film. Yes, Question over there. My name is Roland, Dutch Television. Uh, Mr. Tarantino, this is such a highly anticipated Hollywood production. Why did, have you decided to open here and come? Oh, well, that was kind of a... Um, that, was, that was always the goal, always the dream. Because uh, to me, there's just no place like Cannes for filmmakers on the face of the earth. I mean... I've heard people quote back things I've said, oh, it's the Mount Olympus of cinema, it's the cinema Olympics, it's this, it's that, uh, cinema nirvana. Well, it is. I mean, one of the things that's so wonderful about Khan is during this time here on the Riviera, cinema matters. It's important. I mean, even the things when the people boo and they do this or do that and they're so noisy about this and that and the other, it's out of passion it's not just just images glazing over you it's it, it matters it means something and then um you know uh, and even also the aspect the fact that all the world film press from the from the planet earth america finland iceland greenland you know they're canada. all here <laughs> a couple from canada all right you know uh, <laughs> that's a country i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> but there's something about them all being here and seeing your and like and you drop the movie bam at once everybody weighs in at the exact same time and they argue and they jostle and they do this and they do that and it's like the cat is out of the bag for the entire planet earth and i'm down with that i am not an american filmmaker i make movies for the planet earth and the con is the place that represents that <laughs> Question here, question there, question here. Go Hello, ahead. thank you. This is Carol Guerrero from W Radio in Colombia, right here. Awesome. Way behind the <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would like to know why, is, even today, your interest in doing films about the Second World War that was uh, 64 years ago, so what's the passion of, of, of or, or the interest thing that uh, the Second World War has for you? Well, you know, I mean, uh, you know, on one level, it's you know, on one level, it's just I like dealing in, in genres, all right? And, uh, you know, there's westerns, there's war movies, there's musicals, there's swashbucklers, there's all kinds of things like that. And so to me, it's, a, um, you know, it's, it's, it's another genre in, in movies that I've always really liked. And I've always really liked the, not only that, I like the subgenre aspect of genre, where, you know, there's in war films, there's the big battle film, or there's a bunch of guys on a mission movie, or, you know, and so... That was so the thing that kind of sits me down and, and, and gets me to do it is I like the genre. Let me try a movie in that genre. I think that would be cool. Now that's what sits me down to do it. Then once I sit down and do it, then I start dealing with the war and start dealing with the implications of everything and all that follows after it. But the thing that just sits me down to do it, hey, wouldn't it be fun to make a war movie? Thank you. Question over there. Mm -hmm. Then here. I love one. 
Uh, my name is Oskar Ingolsson from uh, Morgenbladet Iceland. Uh, where, where are you? Here. Oh, thank you. Uh, I, have a question. I have a couple of questions for Tarantino. Uh, first, as a movie lover, would you have been able to, if, you, if in Shoshana's shoes, to burn all those movies? <laughs> oh, it's, it's uh, well, uh, yeah. It's not nothing, okay? It's very difficult. It's, it's very difficult. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, if I was Shoshana in Shoshana's situation where I can take out the entire Nazis and ultimately maybe win the war, uh, yeah, I think maybe I, I, uh, I could do that. Um, and, but you can also look at it as, you know, the cinema itself. It's, it, to me, it's also kind of a, on one hand, there's a, it's a metaphor for uh, the power of cinema. On the other hand, it's not even a metaphor at all. It's literal. It is the power of cinema is going to bring down the Third Reich. And uh, I, I, get a, I get a big kick out of that. But I remember there was at one point, uh, I, I ended up not doing this way, but at one point I thought maybe Shoshana might start the fire. And she would take mm -hmm. a reel of film and you know, light it like a bomb and whoosh, throw it in the pile. And then I was having the decision, okay, now what would she start the fire with? Would she start it with a band print of Grand Delusion? <laughs> Or would she start it with the first reel of Jude Suss? All right, because they both are different things, even though they would have a, you know, the similar outcome. I mean, you know, with with uh, Jude Suss, it would be Garibald's own creation bringing him down. All right, with Grand Illusion, it would be like Papa Jean is right there doing it himself. <laughs> and, and your second part is. And the, <laughs> and the second question. Uh, why is bastard spelled like that? Oh, you know what? Here's the thing. Typo. No, no, it's not a typo. <laughs> uh, here's, the, here's the thing. I'm never going to explain that. You know, when you do an artistic flourish like that, to describe it, to explain it, is just take the piss out of it and invalidate the whole stroke in the first place. You know, it's... Basquiat takes a letter L from a hotel room door and sticks it on his painting. If he describes why he did it, he might as well not have done it at all. So... There you go. That's my answer. <laughs> Before we give the mic to this lady over there, I have a question for both actresses. There are very specific references in the film about actresses. Uh, for instance, the, way, the moment that your Marcel sees you, he just goes, Daniel Darieux, physically, you're wearing the kind of clothes that Daniel Darieux would wear. But did you, Melanie, have a Daniel Darieux or someone as a model um, and then the same question will be addressed to Diane. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Merci. Take that. Yes, guys. Go on. <coughs> Take your headsets. Okay, there was one thing which was quite incredible. Quentin organized a cine club in Berlin every week. We saw lots and lots of films, films from the period. I saw films with Daniel Darrier, among others. A model, no. It's, um, both in the films and in the period as a whole. There's the way of dressing, the way of walking, the way you spend time making up, even in those absurd conditions such as existed during the war. There were always ways of doing things. And so, yes, I was inspired by all that. And then, um, like other Tarantino heroines, uh, there was something very violent and also very mature in the character, perhaps more than those women who were women at a time when women were perhaps not as important. But thanks to Tarantino, women can be independent uh, in a period film like that, and that's quite incredible in itself. The same question, in a way, to Diane Kruger. Um, one line says downward, uh, forget Dietrich, forget Riefenstahl. There's only one, and that's you. And now, uh, were there any actresses of the time that you modeled your character on, and excuse me, who gave you the idea that wearing what you wear to a little taverna might, you know, make you go incognito? <laughs> um, well, Quentin had, um, had uh, sort of briefed me on my character's background for many, many weeks, actually. He um, made me watch quite a few old movies, um, talked to me about what my, my character's background would be in terms of, you know, she's supposed to be this big German movie star, but who is adored by the public because she stayed. She didn't leave um, when the war star started. 
Um, to me, who I was most inspired by was Hildegard Knef, who's a very famous German actress at the time, and she had a voice like that, and you know, and she always talked a bit too loud. <laughs> so that was sort of my inspiration. But Quentin's idea, you, you like, what's her name again? Yeah, there's a Hungarian yeah. actress uh, called uh, Ilona Massey, right. All right, that started with MGM as her possible, a possible replacement for uh, uh, Jeanette McDonald, and then later moved on to Universal, where they tried to turn into their Dietrich, and it, and it didn't quite work out. But um, I've always been a huge fan of hers, and I always thought that if Bridget had gone to America, that it would have been Universal that offered her the contract, and her career would have probably mirror that of Ilona Massey. One of the things that was the funny that you say, well, one, she's Bridget von Hammersmark. She can't go incognito anywhere. So if she's the movie star, she's got to dress the movie star part. But the thing that was so funny about that outfit in particular is I'd seen the movie a while ago, and so we watched it together, and we're watching it, and lo and behold, Ilona Massey walks in a scene in almost an exact replica of what she was yeah. wearing in the La Louisiane Tavern, and our jaws <laughs> hit the floor. <laughs> so true. It's a movie called International Lady, who anyone who cares. <laughs> Question over there, and then over here. Hello, uh, CBC Radio Canada. I've heard that... I'm here. Um, uh, I've heard that for a moment you considered Isabelle Huppert as one of your actresses in that film. How did you feel when you heard she would be the president of the festival? And do you think in a way, even unconsciously, could be a handicap for your film in the competition? Uh, well, no, I, no I, 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 don't, I don't think it'll affect it at all. The thing about it is... Uh, Nobody adores Isabelle Huppert more than myself. I mean, you know, I just read the whole big interview with her and Wes Anderson. I'll match Wes Anderson on Isabelle Huppert movies man for man any day of the fucking week, all right? Uh, and not only that, I mean, there is this aspect that I've always loved the film Heaven's Gate. And to me, there is even little, even though there's no stylistic things between this film and Heaven's Gate, there was, I always had a little Heaven's Gate aspirations as far as the, the film is concerned. I think in particularly the opening credit sequence, kind of like the opening credit sequence of Heaven's Gate. All right. Uh, but the thing is, uh, uh, and when I met her, we talked a lot about Heaven's Gate, amongst other things. But... Um, I, you know the thing is, it just didn't it just didn't work out because of scheduling and and and, and timing wise and deal stuff, all that kind of stuff. It was it's, there was no thing no thing at all. So the thing about it is, I didn't think twice about it because I adore her and she likes me, and I'm sure that we will eventually work together. I can't wait for that day to happen. And so when it was brought up, I didn't have any fear about that at all because there's no acrimony between n there's no acrimony between us that I'm aware of at all. I am still her biggest fan, and I hope one day to work with her. Question, who has the mic over there? Go ahead. Le, le micro, monsieur là-bas, go ahead. Uh, hi, Brian Johnson from uh, McLean's Magazine in Canada. Uh, <coughs> and I will throw a question. Picked the wrong time to try out my Canadian jokes, didn't I? <laughs> I will throw a question to Mike Myers, okay? <laughs> Uh, Mike, what's it like uh, acting in a film that... Hold on, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> acting in a film... Comment uh, c'était the, the, the... Oh, in English. Oh. Um, in a film you didn't direct, and what's it like acting in a film that you didn't direct, and what particular fantasy does this role uh, respond to in your psyche? Well, I, I'm the biggest Quentin Tarantino fan that you'll find. Um, in terms of uh, coming up and serving at the pleasure of the president, it was perhaps the greatest fantasy realized. My, um, my parents are parents. Check, one, two. My, um, my parents uh, were born in Liverpool, England. And my father was in the Royal Engineers, and my mother was in the Royal Air Force. You know, those ladies that had the you know, big maps of England, and they would go. Jerry's over Norfolk, scramble big and hill. My mom was one of those ladies. <laughs> and uh, just World War II was talked about at the table constantly. And so, uh, you know, I got, I got a call. Would you like to be, play a British general? And uh, I, I did a jig, and I was very happy. <laughs> and I'm, I'm still very happy. I kind of can't believe it. I'm having an out-of-body experience at the moment. But, um, you know, World War II films are... Uh, just it's a fascinating genre and I'm just very very honored to be here honored with a U to be here 
<laughs> the lady here behind Hello. the Hello. My name is Christina from German Radio. I have a question to the German actors. Uh, could you tell us about the experience making a film with Quentin Tarantino and Brad Pitt, this Hollywood feeling? And uh, I think Christoph Waltz is getting uh, the, the golden palme uh, bite your tongue. for the best actor. And Brad Pitt, are you able speaking German now? <laughs> Pratt, Pratt spoke uh, German Merci before beaucoup. <laughs> That's the subtitle to it. Right, I, I was subtitled for Brad. <laughs> I mean, the, the experience. It, I, I find answering a question like that, a question like that, rather bewildering. What, what do you guess? It was um, a, a ride, sort of above a dream. And um, Quentin is one of the most acute and astute and precise observers of everything. So to actually be in the hands of someone like that, is, you, you can just do what you're supposed to do without thinking. And, um, and it's, it, it, one can rely on one's own subconscious in a way because it's being taken care of. It's in the best hands. And then, I mean, speaking for myself, I just did it. And um, so referring to a remark of Quentin's before, then I sort of let go and sent my character back into the hands of its maker. <laughs> Daniel? What, what what can I say? I mean, when I when I was 16, I watched Pulp Fiction in, in a movie theater, and after watching the movie, I said to my friend, one day I want to make a real movie. So uh, <laughs> 14 years later, this man called me and, and um, invited me to an audition, which was terrible. Um, the only good thing is there was, <laughs> there, was no French, there was no French version of the script. So, uh, um, so Quentin said, what a shame that you can't do this scene in French. And then I started um, improvising French because I'm half Spanish and I knew these are two Americans who don't speak French anyway. So, <laughs> the, <laughs> so the words that I didn't know, I just said them in, in Spanish. And, uh, <laughs> now you know. <laughs> and on the same day, Quentin um, called and, and offered me the part and I appreciate that very much, the trust in me and in um, the work was just a pleasure and a, and a huge experience for me. You know, I, I, got, I got to say about Daniel, I got to jump in here, and, and it's just the idea that, um, you know, Frederick Zoller is such an important character to the film, and uh, I had never seen Goodbye Lenin, so I was watching these different, uh, different films of, of different young German actors, and... Uh, and I'm, I've become very good friends with uh, uh, Tom Tickler, who not only is my friend, he actually translated for me the German dial uh, the, the English the, uh, the dialogue into German for me for the film. Just uh, I called him up to ask him, uh, could you recommend a good translator for my dialogue? And, and he just said, I'll do it because I know what you want. Um, and so he said, you got to see Goodbye Lenin. And when I watched Goodbye Lenin, I was like, that's my Zoller. That's my Zoller. My that's him right there. I mean. If Daniel's mother didn't meet Daniel's father, I don't know if, I, if so, uh, we'd ever have the right Zoller. I mean, he really, it was as I was watching, this guy's stepping off the fucking page. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question over here. Uh, I'd just like to add first. Uh, the German actors don't get the chance that a lot of others do to break to to perform on an international scale like like we like uh, uh, the Americans and and let me tell you there's there's a good three or four other actors that that are not here today that are August, August Steele, Steele. Uh, Till Schweiger yeah. um, who were just I mean they just amazing performances and we the three of us were talking about it <laughs> we went toe to toe and uh, we learned a few moves from these guys so, yeah, so sure. it's a pleasure they put it down they put it down <laughs> and August Steele is going to have a, a baby whoa, 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 whoa. that is correct August Steele is expecting right. a baby yeah. so hey, August Steele August Steele August. and his August. child we make more little August Steele <laughs> <laughs> it is infant <laughs> question over there I don't know if, uh, my name is Jun Selos from Norway. I don't know if this will lead to another kiss, but um, 
Uh, Brad, could you be so kind to talk a little bit more about... Come on. I'm sorry? Uh, talk a little bit more about your role in the whole project and your, your connection with the, uh, with the Quinton and all that. Could you, I mean, just a little sure, bit more sure. than 10 um, words. Thank you. Quinton came to visit in, uh, sometime at the end of the summer with the script. Um, and all I know, we, went, what, we talked about it, we talked about backstory, we talked about movies till the wee hours of the night. And uh, I got up the next morning and I saw five empty bottles of wine laying on the floor. Five. <laughs> and something that resembled a, a smoking apparatus. I don't know what that was about. <laughs> and apparently I agreed to do the movie because six weeks later, I was in uniform and I was Lieutenant Aldo Rain. So, go figure. Listen, he took, you know, he's been working on this script eight years, and, uh, and he, said at that, he said that night, we're going to make can, and this was August or something ridiculous. And uh, it was, I, I knew it instantly upon reading it. It was, it was, uh, it was uh, these ones don't come along very often, and uh, I, I felt very privileged uh, to, to and, and, and that I'd earned this moment. So I was, I was really happy to finally, finally arrived. <laughs> Can I say that? And, uh, and literally, so uh, six weeks later, we were shooting. Um, as I say, we wrapped three months ago, and, and here we are. And I wish all films could be made this way. <laughs> but it's a real pleasure working for an auteur. You can see how much he loves film. It's, a, it's, a, it's something else to be around and, and something else to come here to the Holy Lands with him, with a film he, <laughs> to, uh, to be a part of one of his films. So. And, you know, and, let me, and, and let me say something where it's the fact that, uh, um, you know, me and artistically, me and Brad have been sniffing around each other for a while. Like, the, long, long, the longing looks across the room and everything, <laughs> and, you know. Uh, the little notes, I like you, do you like me? Yes box, no box, check one. <laughs> flirty, flirty text messages to each other. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and the thing is, one of the questions I get oftentimes is like, oh, what? You know what? Uh, what actors would you like to work with? And Brad has always been one of the ones that I've said. But the thing is, I, I don't work like that though. I, it's about my characters. I mean, it's it's all about that. And so the thing about it is, I was like, okay, one of these days, I hope I write a character that would be terrific for Brad. And if that is the case, then that collaboration will go to the moon. It'll be a It'll be a, a, a Babe Ruth home run, and uh, and so that as like somewhere pretty quickly, all right, into uh, the the text of writing Aldo, I was like, okay. This is the one for Brad. This is the one for Brad. And then I started getting fucking nervous, all right? Because, like, shit, if he doesn't do it, what the fuck am I going to do? <laughs> he had me at hello. <laughs> <laughs> I had him at bonjour. <laughs> je t'aime, je t'aime, je t'aime. <laughs> hello. Uh, Hugh Daye from uh, Belgian TV. Yeah. Uh, from Belgian TV, RTBF. It's a question from Brad Pitt. Uh, it's a very, very rich year. We saw you play a silly guy in the Coen Brothers movie. We saw you uh, an extraordinary character in Benjamin Button, and here, uh, a bastard. I would like to know if you want really to find roles who are completely different than romantic comedies and Hollywood blockbusters, and how do you, do you manage that? How do you choose that? Thank you. Um, it's, it's always looking for something new, something, you know, that you haven't um, explored before. You know, I, I don't want to get too accurate on it, but um, something that feels fresh and in a new direction. And, and more than anything, as I get older, it's, it's really about the company I keep and, and how do you want to spend that time because that time takes you away from your family, takes you away from months, and, and it better be, be with people that you respect and it better be something that, that means something to you. So... Uh, Actually, as I get along, it's easier to, to choose. But yes, variety, variety. I like a, I like a bit of variety. <laughs> Kill me if you must, but I'm afraid our time is up. Thank you very much for being here. Right, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.